Hi, my name is Joe Park. I'm CEO of Horizon Stewardship, and I'm thrilled to have with me today Stan Reif. He's a CPA and a partner, professional practice lead in Cape and Kraus. Cape and Kraus is the largest uh, accounting firm in the United States whose practice is solely on uh, nonprofits and churches. Joining Stan today is his uh, partner, Ted Batson, who's a CPA and a licensed attorney. He's also a partner at Cape and Kraus, their tax counsel and the professional uh, lead for the tax department. So Ted, the SBA was given responsibility in the CARES Act to come up with guidance on the forgiveness process. When is that guidance due and how will we see that roll out? So Joe, that uh, guidance was alluded to in the first interim rule that you know Stan referred to a couple a little bit ago to these interim rules that have been coming out. And in that guidance, they focus a lot on the application process and they said, we will have guidance coming on loan forgiveness, but they didn't set a due date. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, the due date is largely going to be driven by when they have a loan application available. So we don't, you know, if, if people applied for these loans and got their loan dollars in that, you know, first little window of maybe uh, April 10th to 15th kind of time frame, their uh, eight week period, uh, as it's currently defined, is going to run out around the first week of June. So we would expect that by that time, we would have some degree of certainty about how to calculate some of these things. Now, unfortunately, that's kind of late for people to be able to shift or make changes uh, to what to what their plans were. Uh, so that's kind of the outside edge of when guidance might become available. Uh, or earliest I'm expecting is mid-May, uh, but that's a guess. It's not a promise. Uh, and of course, we're all waiting anxiously for this guidance because it's going to give us a little bit more comfort that we actually know what we're talking about. Uh, with respect to say, for example, the five factors that Stan referenced earlier that were talked about in a previous broadcast. So there's, uh, there's uh, uh, no firm date. It will come out in the form of a ruling or a rule, an interim rule is what they're called. And hopefully it's gonna give us a lot of guidance on computational things as well as what's included. Now, I don't actually know that it's gonna address the other question that we're going to be addressing uh, later in this in this uh, conversation about the needs based aspects of this, I don't know if that guidance will cover that or not. So let's get right to it. Uh, this past week, Steve Mnuchin uh, did a, an interview where he talked about needs based testing. Uh, then the SBA followed up with an FAQ that alluded to liquidity as a, a needs based test. Uh, the confusion seems to be um, what churches and nonprofits certified was their circumstance when they borrowed the loan versus the Treasury's understanding of that today. Can you guys go into that and, and talk about its implications to the churches and nonprofits that are listening today? So Joe, as you noted, the certification, the original certification language in the loan application that people were signing and attesting to reads, current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. And I will tell you that I, along with many others, when this was first uh, out there, and this was has been in the application, even in the drafts of applications, uh, from the very beginning, and it was, and a version of this language actually appears in the CARES Act itself. So this was not manufactured uh, by the SBA. It's actually a required certification in the language of the CARES Act itself. But our original focus was on the very first phrase of this: current economic uncertainty uh, makes this loan request and then necessary to support uh, ongoing operations. Because if you recall, back in early April, and this is one of those cases where money. Uh, Monday morning quarterbacking is likely to come into play because we have to think about what things were like in early April when uh, stay-at-home orders were first being issued and we were all trying to understand just, you know, uh, how bad is this going to get and how long is it going to last. That economic uncertainty at that time certainly made people wonder, well, I may have some cash in the bank, but is it going to be enough? Uh, and so now 
with the benefit of hindsight and the benefit of some high profile parties getting uh, PPP loans and then uh, and having some public relations fall out from that, I think Treasury has felt a lot of heat to uh, address the fact that some very small lenders may have, or borrowers, excuse me, may have been pushed to the side while these larger players were getting uh, their turn in line. Uh, and that's a bad, that's bad public relations for the government and bad public relations for the Small Business Administration. So clearly they've latched on this and uh, latched on the necessity side, the second half of this uh, as their kind of the anchor point that they've chosen to take now. Uh, now they have made clear in not only the, in the FAQs that have come out that people will only be judged according to the standards that were in play at the time they made their loan application. And this makes it a little bit hard to process uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin's comment that in the loan forgiveness phase, that they're going to be taking a look at this necessity element, uh, because that seems to be a lot of Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking on the process and changing the ground from, out under, from underneath people's feet. Two questions uh, come to mind. First, what are the liquidity implications to churches and nonprofits based on current guidance? What should they be doing uh, to maximize their forgiveness or to determine whether they should look at this loan as not likely to be forgiven and adjust their operations based on that? So it's a really good question. Um, we don't know how many loans will actually be looked at. In his initial statement, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin indicated anyone with a loan over $2 million uh, would be audited, and we don't know what audited means in this context. Um, we don't know if it simply means that their use of the funds will be audited, although he seemed to allude to the fact that there might be some audit of their need for the loan at the time they applied. And again, that would seem to be, in a lot of respects, changing the ground from underneath people's feet uh, with respect to the uh, expectations uh, that everyone had at the time they applied. Um, late, later, I've seen some reports saying that, that the SBA has said, well, all loans are gonna get looked at. Well, again, they don't have the manpower to look at every loan. So how many loans will actually get looked at is, another, is a whole nother question. But, our position at this point is that you need to document your, uh, your, your organization, your church, uh, your uh, school, whatever the, the, the nature of the relationship is, you, or the organization is, you need to document uh, how you can substantiate that you made this certification in good faith. And we've been working on trying to identify some, some markers that you can use to make, uh, to, to put down on paper uh, kind of uh, a memo that indicates, all right, here's the relevant facts. And perhaps some folks will do this analysis and reach the conclusion that they could not in good faith make that certification. And if that's the case, they have until May 7th to, the, to return the funds and be deemed to be good citizens and to have be deemed to have acted in good faith. Uh, but for others, it's going to be a, a, a call where they're going to say, no, we can clearly demonstrate for whatever reason, uh, based on their facts and circumstances, that this was a legitimate exercise on our part to go through the process of applying for the loan and then using the funds. And there will be a group of people in the middle for, where they're going to have to make an internal judgment call as to whether or not uh, they follow, which camp they fall in. Uh, and, and that's uh, going to be left to those, to those leaders to make that choice. So you're really talking about whether uh, the church or nonprofit took the loan at all. Uh, is, that a, is that going to be a factor in the forgiveness, or is that about uh, prosecution for um, uh, taking a loan they shouldn't have taken? Yeah, so it's very, it's very unclear um, how they can go, what they can do at the time they're reviewing this. Could they go back and say, you got the loan, you can't demonstrate you needed the loan, and therefore we're simply going to not forgive it, and now you have a loan that has a two-year maturity on it? Or would they, could they come back and say, you got the loan in bad faith, and therefore we're going to rescind the loan, and, you, and it's all due and, and, and payable back immediately? Uh, those seem to be the two choices. Um, my impression is it would be very hard for them to argue. And, and then I guess there is a third choice I should eliminate, uh, 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 mention because Secretary Mnuchin mentioned, and that is there are some statements in the uh, act and in the subsequent guidance that came out 
that there are uh, there is room for there to be allegations of fraud, including criminal fraud in this in this context. I think that's a pretty far fetched allegation because it'd be there has to be an intent to defraud, and I don't believe there would. I'd, I'd be it would be a very high threshold for most churches and other nonprofits uh, for the for a government prosecutor to demonstrate the rec, the, the necessary level of intent uh, to reach a criminal prosecution. So I think for the most part, we can set those scary words aside. Uh, I think, you know, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin in kind of a knee jerk reaction is kind of reminding people you have an, op you have an obligation to act in good faith. And, and there were some players that I think people felt weren't acting in good faith. Although I, I really question if that ever got into a courtroom, I'm not sure they could, they could sustain that claim uh, that they acted in bad faith. Now, in this particular situation, I think if it, the starting point is always going to be, can you demonstrate your payroll cost and your mortgage interest, rent, and utilities, the things that Stan referenced earlier? That's going to be the starting point for discussion. Whether or not an audit program that would come out and, and, and review this is going to actually delve deep into the whole necessity thing, and will they make a distinction of nonprofits versus other industries? You know, the original notice that came out, or original FAQ was aimed at public companies. They later came back and supplemented that with a reference to saying, no, this applies to private companies too. But in the liquidity side of this equation, which is the real focus that they've seemed to be adding in this later FAQ was this requirement for liquidity or, or assessment of your liquidity to decide whether or not you could certify this in good faith. It's very unclear how much liquidity is enough. There's no, been no standard established. There's nothing that says, well, if I have two months of cash reserves, was I in bad faith if I certified? If I had six months of cash reserves, or am I in bad faith? If I had a year, am I in bad faith? We don't know the answer to that. And there's no, been no guidance that substantiates that. The other thing the FAQ said that's important is it talked about, would you have significant detriment to your operations if you didn't apply for this loan? But nobody's described what significant detriment is. Is it enough that uh, you had a loss in, in revenue? Is it a, did you, would it require you to in fact have uh, net losses in your organization? Would you have to shut down? Would you have to lay off, you know, a hundred, you know, 75% of your staff? What is significant in this context? We don't know. And so there's all these even though there seems to be a, a, some phrasing that's trying to add some clarity to this, all, to me, all it does is muddy the water further because it introduces new terms that lack definition. Uh, it's almost as though uh, the Small Business Administration says, we will know what bad faith is when we see it. <laughs> With no real guidance to let everybody else know, well, when will we, how would we know we've acted in bad faith? when you can't tell us what bad faith is. Ted, let me see if I can repeat back what you've said. Uh, we now have additional information that we didn't at the time of certification, where the SBA seems to be interested in a liquidity test that they, and a needs test that they have yet to define what that looks like. In your estimation, there are three possible alternatives uh, out there that that might come about if the SBA deemed that you were uh, in bad faith because of your liquidity. The first is the uh, could be criminal prosecution, which you think is pretty far fetched for uh, most uh, churches and uh, nonprofits. The second is that they could demand the loan be repaid back. The third is it's simply the loan is simply not forgiven. You now have a 1% loan over a two year period of time that um, you may have thought would be a grant, but is now a loan. A am I repeating that back accurately? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So what are you advising your churches that uh, as they look at their balance sheets and they have uh, unrestricted funds, what are you advising them to do in terms of uh, determining first, did we make the application in good faith? And second, uh, what are the follow-on steps if they think they made the application in good faith, but are concerned about its forgivability? So the first thing we're uh, counseling clients to do is to make sure they document 
the facts and circumstances as they can best document them around this good faith certification. And so that's going to uh, involve a number of steps. This is still kind of an evolving thing. You might uh, continue to pay attention uh, to things that we'll be publishing over the next week or so as we're trying to, to give some clients guidance on this point. But I think it's important that you quantify your unrestricted cash reserves. And, and when we talk about unrestricted cash reserves, specifically, we're thinking of things that don't have a donor restriction on them. So the fact that your governing board has set aside funds for a rainy day or for a specific future purpose, um, that's probably inadequate to exclude them from your unrestricted cash reserves. We are really only talking about donor restrictions when we're gonna exclude something from the definition of unrestricted cash reserves. So an you example have your... of that. So an example of uh, an unrestricted versus a restricted account. A restricted account might be uh, the donor gave to a building fund or to um, a specific purpose, uh, rebuild of the organ, versus the church has taken uh, some funds and put them in, say, a, a maintenance sinking fund, uh, rainy day fund, uh, uh, reserves, that sort of thing. Correct. Those would be. Uh, those are good examples of, on both sides of that uh, this, that divide. So that's very helpful. Uh, to have those examples in, in, in hand and in mind. But, you know, your sources of unrestricted cash reserves are not the only thing that would be on the table here. You should also be thinking about your future cash receipts. So uh, taking a look at contributions and you know, ties and offerings. And if you're a school, you've got tuition revenues involved, you want to be thinking about that. Or if you have a preschool or, or any other kind of, of service offering that you do that has, has revenues associated with it, You'll want to be forecasting that, and it could be that that forecast looks pretty dismal right now. You know, your your uh, preschool may be shut down and may not be generating any revenue, or or your ties and offerings may have dropped off dramatically as you've had layoffs affect your congregation uh, and so forth. So it could be that we've got some unrestricted cash reserves, and we have and we're forecasting some cash receipts, but those forecasts are dismal. Uh, other examples maybe they're strong, and that would that would be a, another thing. Now back in April, you may or April. 13th, if you're loan funded on April 13th and you apply for it, say on April 3rd, you may not have had any idea what, what contributions were going to look like. So you might want to be documenting conversations you were having internally that, hey, back in, you know, on April 5th, we met, our, our, our leadership met, and we were, we documented concerns over whether giving would remain strong. And so we, we filed this application in a, in a context in which we had no clue how giving would, uh, would, happen during the next month. And the fact that it was strong afterwards should not cloud the picture of what things were like on the day you made your loan application. Because remember, you're certifying at the time of application, not certifying with a crystal ball about what's going to happen over the next four, eight, 12 weeks. Um, you're also going to want to forecast your cash needs. So this is uh, going to be around everything from do you have a decline in cash needs because services have, are being held online instead of in person or buildings aren't having to be cleaned as frequently or, or those kind of things? Or are you going to have increased demand on cash because of coronavirus-related services you're providing uh, to the community or to others in the, in, the, in the area? So you want to make sure you're capturing that picture. And I typically would say to capture that picture on both the receipts and the disbursement side through June 30 and then also through the end of the year. Uh, so that you can paint a, a holistic picture because you may have enough cash reserves to carry you through June 30 without this PPP loan, but you may not have enough cash reserves through the end of the year to carry you through the end of the year. Uh, so you would want to be able to document that, yeah, we had some cash reserves on you know April uh, 3rd when we filed our loan application, but those reserves would have evaporated quickly and this money was required in order that we could carry on programs all through the rest of the year and retain staff beyond the time period of this loan. We have no idea when all of this is gonna truly lift, even though there are some states that are lifting their stay-at-home orders, we don't know when that will, when that will uh, 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 be universal and when it will be uh, a business as usual, if that's even a term we're ever gonna be able to use again. Uh, I think there's a couple of other things to be very mindful of here. One is, to document 
you know, if we didn't get this loan, we would have been forced to lay staff, staff off. Um, you know, a, as a church, you're under no obligation to say that you would have spent your reserves to retain staff if, if the staff would have had to be let go absent these funds because you were just being good fiscal stewards of your funds. Uh, I would document that that point. Uh, uh, you know, in our, I know in my own congregation, we've continued to pay our preschool workers, uh, even though there's no preschool activity going on. Uh, this PPP loan uh, it allows us to make the choice to continue to pay them for an even extended period of time, a longer period of time. Uh, otherwise, we would have had to, at some point, say, we're, we're done. You're going to need to just go and file for unemployment now. It's, a, it's fortunate that they have the opportunity to apply for unemployment now, because that's historically not been the case. So just because a church has unrestricted reserves uh, doesn't mean they would have used them. Their option may have been to say, we want to keep those reserves because of uncertainties around the future. Our choice would be to lay people off, uh, some of which would not be uh, covered under employment, unemployment insurance because they work for a church. It would be great if you had actually had contemporaneous conversations with your loan applications about if we don't do this, we're going to have to make the tough call to lay, lay people off. But if we're successful in getting this loan, we will retain people. If you've got uh, minutes from a, a, a leadership meeting or things like that, that would substantiate those conversations were happening in real time, then that's, that is great. That is stronger evidence than being able, than going back and simply documenting today that we had those conversations, but I would document it in either case. So Stan, you've been talking about uh, documenting conversations. You've been talking about documenting uh, and forecasting, not just uh, this period, but through the rest of the year to demonstrate what, what you believe your outcome would be. Are, are these to uh, prove that you took the loan in good faith? Are these going to have an implication in the forgiveness process? I think it's a both and, Joe. So documenting the process certainly shows good faith that you're monitoring. You know, certainly as a church, you would want to monitor on a weekly basis anyways. What's your, um, you know, the, from tithes and offerings every week, certainly it's a very disrupted state. In fact, that you're not able to meet face-to-face -face and congregate to take the traditional offering. So it's all being uh, moved online. Uh, so documenting that shows a fiduciary responsibility that should be taking place anyways. And the fact that you're doing this and monitoring it and doing some comparisons. So hopefully you've done this last year. And so I think uh, it will strengthen the loan forgiveness. Again, there's a lot of ambiguity of what will all be applied. Certainly on the for-profit side, they're looking at uh, revenues this year versus last year. Is it you know, net revenue versus last year? Do you have to incur losses as Ted's already mentioned? On the not-for-profit side, we're not exactly sure what all is going to be involved. So the more documentation you can do of saying, here's the giving we have received week over week this year over this period since, let's call it April 1, when you know the whole um, shelter at home scenarios nationally start rolling out. And then you know kind of do the comparison to last year so you can demonstrate financial harm or hardship. Same with your expenses. Either expenses have you know gone down accordingly and it becomes good fiscal management for you as a church. So you want to document, are we doing, are we going to be able to cash flow? Do we need to make other changes? Um, but certainly as Ted again alluded to, your expenses may have gone down in one category, your occupancy and Sunday morning expenses, but you may have offset those by increased expenses to have impact in the community as you're serving them through food banks or helping um, you know, through, uh, you know, maybe the purchase of PPE uh, for first line responders. There's so many incredible programs that churches are doing that incur some costs. Document all that as you go for two reasons. One, as a church, we should be knowing what we're, how we're spending our dollars. Anyways, it helps us manage how have we changed as a church? How are we doing financially as we've pivoted during the season? And all of that contemporaneous information of Comparisons to last year on the impact of the COVID-19 on income and expense will further strengthen whatever those guidelines end up being when they actually do come out later on. And again, it's, we're, we're trying to communicate, 
nobody knows yet <laughs> what the forgiveness actual provisions will be both on needs base as well as uh, the supporting documentation beyond the five key areas we're you know we're aware of that's why we're trying to uh, encourage everybody to do the additional documentation the additional comparisons which only strengthen that fiduciary responsibility we should be doing anyways uh, but then that will again show that good faith and potentially uh, you know, the, well, or certainly the financial impact, whether it's harm or the additional expenses from uh, this, uh, the season that we're in. Let me just piggyback with one thing on one thing Stan said there. I think this notion of the disruption that has occurred in the church world in particular with having to move to online worship, moving to uh, people having to go to electronic forms of giving perhaps when they've, uh, when we don't have a collection plate to, pa to pass for tithes and offerings. The fact that uh, extended periods of this online worship have probably caused many churches to have to think about expending on equipment and infrastructure to be able to support that for the long term. But then above and beyond that, if this, if this is going to continue on for, for many more months, uh, churches and other like organizations are going to have to be thinking about how do we enhance community and how do we keep and maintain community. And there's going to be a price tag that comes with whatever that looks like, whether it's additional technology to facilitate that, whether it's putting in place uh, uh, infrastructure in the church building to, to help uh, maintain social distancing and having, you know, washing stations and things, you know, with uh, hand sanitizers and things like that more strategically placed. All of those things have a price tag with them. Now, how you forecast that, I don't know. And some of those things are not readily available right now and will require um, you know, more time before they are available. But this disruption element, I think, is a, a huge part of documenting the uncertainty. Uh, and the impact it's had on churches is they've had to, to go to different models of, of having worship and so forth really uh, lends to the notion that, that even regardless of what our cash reserves are, we have disruption going on, and, and that heightens the level of uncertainty about the future. So what I understand that you're saying is that if I am a church of any kind, I need to not only be documenting the expenditures we're making, but I need to be documenting what we were thinking, what led us to make this application, what those uncertainties look like. I need to be documenting the disruptive nature of this on my uh, income statement and balance sheet, uh, both capturing uh, the story of how we've been impacted and also uh, forecasting what we believe based on where we are today, the future outcome of this will be. Tell me what I need to be doing in relationship to unrestricted uh, accounts and funds that we have available to us. Uh, Stan, certainly can one, you answer that? One of the things I would certainly uh, speak to on that, Joe, would be uh, from an operational side, if you will, as an executive pastor, director of finance of a church, uh, there's certain presence has already been set that as a church we always maintain these thresholds as a policy for example we may have a requirement to have an operational reserve of x amount of time for the uncertainty so we can have continuity of staff so you you, you establish that the, you know we're not padding the accounts now but you know and again the other item that i think is part of this um currently and then uh, looking to the future as well is we certainly all recognize within the church environment is the summer slump. People go on vacation, giving drops. So normally during the season, we would be increasing our reserves in anticipation of summer. So the fact that you have a little bit higher reserves in the spring when this hits and you're not able to build it creates an un um, the additional disruption come summer. And then again, some of that giving that may be taking place right now, speaking back to what we talked about, at the time we were certifying the loan application, the disruption that was taking place and the uncertainty that had been created was too early to detect in the, that first month of April. Not everybody had gotten laid off yet. They may still have been getting their severance and they were still able to make the contributions to the church. We're starting to see lags you know, a few weeks later as those funds have dried up, as people are waiting for their stimulus check, as people are waiting for the PPP loans to come to their employer so they can stay on, 
and they're on their last week of employment if they don't get the loan dollars. So the de delay to the church is there. And certainly, as we start thinking about the future and the documentation and the analytics, and again, I'm speaking operationally now, that fall season, we've got to be sustainable because what we are seeing and are aware that even though in many states, and I happen to live in Georgia, and our governor has been very uh, an early adopter, if you will, to opening up, and certainly it's all in the news. And so right or wrong, Georgia's opening up, but what we're seeing in Georgia is a lot of churches aren't opening yet because it's hard to have a church environment that allows for social distancing. Certainly you may find a way to have the congregation sit, family sit together within the congregation, skipping rows and alternating sides of the rows that you sit in, but you still can't, it's gonna be very, very difficult to have a children's nursery or children's environments because how do you control kids in these Sunday school classrooms or small group environments in a safe manner where they may be ca the carriers of the virus back to their families otherwise? So all these disruption is causing some families who are eager to get back together. Many families are hesitant to get back together and some families are not going to be getting back together. So the long-term effect into this fall creates the ongoing uncertainty because it's not like a business that you can you can regulate and say, okay, we'll allow so many people come in for service and then you can leave and we'll, you don't just rotate people through this traditional worship service. So there's a lot of creativity taking place on how to off offset that operationally. So that's for that ongoing continuity of the funding to allow you to maintain the staffing levels, the services to the community in a disrupted environment. So what I hear you saying is that if I'm a church and we've got significant cash, uh, unrestricted cash reserves, that our best strategy today is to uh, demonstrate how keeping those reserves in hand uh, is um, necessary based on the uncertainty that we are forecasting in our, uh, in our other areas. To also document conversations where we say, if we're not using these PPP loans, that we would in fact need to be laying people off because these reserves are necessary to ensure the ongoing viability of our church. And rather than use them and, and bring our reserves to zero, uh, we would choose to lay people off. And thus the, the purpose of the PPP loans to maintain uh, paychecks for um, people that work for us are in fact, um, it is in fact being honored. Let, let me add one more comment to that, Joe, and, and I'd like to have Ted speak to this. And we may or may not want this in the segment, so I'll pause right there, um, but let me go ahead and create the scenario. So, Joe, I, I think one of the other key uh, aspects to the not-for-profit community and the church world is that we're not like a for-profit company that provides a good and service at a profit. By the very nature of a not-for-profit, of a ministry, of a church, it's intended to benefit the community. So it's not just salaries. It's not just selling widgets and services. If the church has to lay off staff and it ceases to operate, the good to society evaporates. And that's an inherent, very unique contribution that the churches make. And I think there's an argument to me said that having the continuity of these services, having the reserves available to be able to keep serving the local community through, again, the spiritual aspects, through the community service that we provide, the helping of the needy, whether it's the food banks or the counseling centers or you know, all these other services that we provide and volunteer for, supporting the frontline uh, workers, healthcare providers, et cetera. That funding is critical and it is all part of that 501c3 and church where people aren't profiting from it. It's a way of giving back to the community and creating that cash flow to do that not just today, not just this summer, but in the fall when, you know, again, there's some conversations that there may be a resurgence of this come fall. The church needs to be taking the time now to prepare to be strong spiritually, emotionally, and financially to re-engage again in this unseen enemy that we're fighting. 
So in summary, what I'm hearing you say is that the, um, the actual guidelines around the loan forgiveness process have yet to be created. We do have some guidance which indicates that liquidity may in fact be a factor. So you are advising churches to begin to not only document their expenditures, but to document the, the conversation that they're having around, if we didn't have the PPP loans, we would be laying people off. If I have large cash reserves, which would be the churches who are most at risk, uh, we document why uh, we need those reserves in view of the disruption that um, we foresee and that our choice would have been to lay people off as opposed to draw down those reserves. So you're really building an argument for forgiveness and that's the best you can do today. Absolutely. I would say then in contrast to that, uh, just you know, for that church who really does have plenty of funding, and they came into this understanding that they thought it was a grant, that this was money if they applied for, it would be forgiven if they spent it the way they were supposed to. Um, and now, you know, the terms are changing, and they don't, they realize that they may not have really needed the money, that, um, you know, they don't want the, you know, if you will, the publicity or the risk management of that. Again, we'll come back to, they have till May 7th to decide, you know what, we're just gonna give the money back because we really didn't need it. We don't really fall in that category where we would have been laying off employees. We were just signing up for the grant dollars that were being given, and now it's been redefined. And indeed, I am working with some of our clients who are in that position, who are saying, we signed up because we understood it was to offset the inconvenience of having to close our operations, our church for a season, our ministry for a season, et cetera. But the reality is we don't really have to have the money and we can't certify that we would have laid off employees, that we don't have enough money. And so many of them have uh, met, not many, a handful that I've worked with have decided, you know, we're gonna decline the money and either give it back or not accept it when it actually is given. And that's always a legitimate uh, response as well in good faith. So don't feel like, you know, you signed up for it, you have to take it and go through everything. If you determine, you know what, we really do have enough money and this doesn't make that much difference to us. Uh, at the end of the day, in good faith, the moral response really is, it's okay to give it back. Stan, for, for the typical church out there that um, does believe the uncertainty warranted this, that they made a good decision and that the risk is whether the loan will uh, be forgivable or not. Uh, what you would recommend them to do is to do this, um, what you would recommend them to follow as a process is to do the documentation that you've described, you and uh, Ted have described earlier, and uh, to treat this as a loan that may be forgiven uh, is not necessarily a grant that is absolutely going to be uh, forgiven, and to, to essentially deal with the additional um, forgiveness process as it unfolds. So there's a low risk of prosecution. If you feel like you can um, clear the moral uh, barrier of did, did we really need these funds, uh, it may be at some point in the future when your future is more clear, you say, you know what, we're going to return these funds now because we didn't need them. Or you find out they're not forgiven and then you um, either return the funds or have a low cost loan. So the risk is actually fairly low uh, holding on to these. What you're risking is having a low cost loan over uh, a, a two year period of time, assuming that you can document that you clear the moral hurdle of uh, taking funds because you needed to and not simply because you thought it was a, a grant or a handout from the government. It is a really fair way of, say, of saying it, Joe. I suppose there will be a group of people who will have made a decision that they think they've adequately documented their good faith, uh, and then they get reviewed and the government comes back and says, we don't believe you acted in good faith. 
uh, and there, there'll be people on, in kind of this little space in the middle where there's uh, disagreement. And uh, some of those folks may end up pay, paying the money back uh, at, under protest, if you will. Um, and there may be, it may not be churches that do this, but there may be organizations where this issue is litigated and we get more clarity through the litigation process. But that's months, if not years into the future. Well, gentlemen, this has been incredibly helpful for our listeners. I do want to remind uh, those that are um, listening right now that we have two additional webinars set up with Cape and Crouch. Uh, one is an update on May the 7th, um, what we know now and what we need to do about it. And then cash flow management, budgeting and church financial strategies for the remainder of 2020 on May 19th. If you'd like to sign up for those, uh, you can do it in our Resilient Leadership uh, series or you can go to horizons.net and uh, sign up there. Thank you so much for being with us today. This was incredibly helpful. And I, I think our churches are um, going to be appreciative of, of the time that you gave today to clear this up for them. What would you say to churches that um, specifically have questions and uh, want to, to contact you to potentially uh, retain you all as a, a service provider to help counsel them? So Joe, certainly uh, they can go to our uh, website uh, and on the slide is also Ted and my personal contact information, our phone numbers, our email addresses. Uh, again, Ted is certainly uh, one of the most uh, sought after uh, Christian tax attorneys and, and CPAs. We're delighted that he uh, is with the firm. And so if anything that's tax related, please contact Ted directly. I'm delighted to be a partner with him. If you're asking about anything dealing with the financial side of, you know, operational side uh, of a church um, processes, uh, feel free to contact me and we'll be happy to work with you. Uh, regardless of what state you're in, we can assign you to, uh, to a, a local office. And then certainly, you know, we also provide auditing services. And so uh, to keep it simple, feel free to just, you know, contact me and I'll get you in contact with the uh, right uh, audit partner in the right city uh, with close proximity to, to meet your needs.